Okay. Well, got it. All right. Um, well, thanks, Carol, for inviting me to do this. And thanks, Corey, for arranging everything. Um, and let me get my screen up here. Okay, you guys can see a PowerPoint now? It's loading. Yes, okay. we can now. Okay, so um, it's always terrifying to give a zoom through a PowerPoint with some animation, but we'll see how it goes here. Um, <laughs> thank you all uh, for, for inviting me to talk. This is the first time I've, I've put this talk together um, in this way. So um, frank feedback is appreciated. Um, you guys can catch me or afterward or um, when we're working together and, and let me know what worked and what didn't work. So what I'm going to do, I'm, I'm, as you guys know, a big believer in people. Um, people remember things and humans work best by narrative and kind of stories. And so what I'm going to tell today is um, the story of visualization and tracheal access. And we're going to use a co-evolution model to start to understand why we fail at intubation and why we succeed and how that's been changing over time. Um, let's see here, is it gonna let me advance? Yep, so the objectives, um, I want you guys to understand that intubation is a constantly evolving phenomenon, although it's evolving extremely slowly. And why intubations fail, um, in my model, they fail because we have an unbalanced coevolution of the different components of intubation. Um, visualization components, and tracheal access components, um, models for intubation anatomy. We're gonna go through how that's changing with the introduction of video laryngoscopy. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about rescue intubations because those are really the hardest intubations we do for um, reasons I'll make clear later. Um, and we'll talk about combined technique when we use, um, when we use dynamic stylex <laughs> fiber optic bronchoscope with a video laryngoscope that's called combined technique. And we'll talk about that. Um, and dynamic tracheal access. Okay, so disclosures. I'm a consultant for SunMed. I'm also the inventor of the TCI dynamic introducer, and I'm the CEO of TTC Med, and I have a big bias. Um, my belief is that dynamic introducers are inevitable, are the inevitable next step in tracheal access. And so um, anybody who's worked with me understands that bias, um, but it's right out there for everybody to see today. Okay, so um, I started thinking about intubation a lot, a lot more than I did when I was a resident and a lot more than I did when I was in private practice or even in academic practice when I did a three-year sabbatical um, and I was working for Mercy Ships. It was an extreme hospital environment. We were in Guinea and Rwanda and uh, we had first world surgical um, suites and first world surgical talent and anesthesia talent. Um, and we could pull that ship right up to uh, kind of the hardest place to be a human or get care in the world and provide first class care. So the specialty of the ship was um, head and neck and maxillofacial stuff. So I was faced with a lot of extremely difficult intubations in a remote environment with uh, teams that I wasn't familiar with. People were coming and going all the time. I was there for 10 months at a time. Somebody else was coming for two or three weeks. Um, so what I understood when you are in those kind of pressure cooker environments, you start to understand the problems with advanced airway techniques or advanced intubation techniques. They're right in your face. They're slow. They're expensive. They need a lot of tech support. They generally need two skilled providers to pull off. And they're super hard and they're super stressful for us. You know, if you check the patient's heart rate during an awake intubation, it's pretty high. If you check your own, I think you'd see it's high as well. Um, and these problems are universal. Doesn't matter if you're on a ship or if you're in Kigali, Rwanda, or if you're in the neuro suite here, um, these problems exist everywhere. We just cover them up here with a lot of extra training and a lot of extra money. So this was the index case for me. This kid is, uh, his name's Abu Bakar, and he had a mid-face defect on his lower, or on his upper lip. And so he got what was called an Abbey flap. And that's where you swing a flap from the lower lip to the upper lip, you sew it in place and you leave it for eight weeks. And then you cut that bridge and they have an upper lip. Now, um, the problem is I had to, so you essentially sew their mouth shut 
and I had to intubate him three or four times, I think, uh, during before we cut the flap to debreed it and to care for it. And so he was getting awake fiber optics over and over, and he didn't like that. He, he was about 10 years old. Um, I didn't like it. And um, our fiber optic scope actually broke. And so it was we, we had to figure out a way to intubate him um, without a fiber optic bronchoscope, a working fiber optic bronchoscope. I used a video laryngoscope. And then we had a whole bunch of ambu scopes, um, but like all good aid organizations, somebody had donated 20 ambu scopes, but no screen. So we couldn't actually visualize through them. And I used it as a dynamic stylet and found I was able to intubate him very quickly and easily. And that's really where I got started on, um, on trying to develop a purpose-built dynamic stylet instead of cross-purposing fiber optic bronchoscopes. So VL for visualization, and this is called a combined technique, and I was not the first nor the only one to start using this, but it was in the era where a whole bunch of people were kind of um, discovering it all at once. So VL for visualization, fiber optic bronch as a dynamic introducer, and um, what you find is if you can see with the video laryngoscope suddenly with the dynamic introducer, you can access the trachea easily. So we're gonna go through some key models. I love models, as you guys all know. Um, we're gonna talk about serpentine airway geometry, intubation as a system with different components in it, dynamic stylets versus static stylets, and combined techniques. So this is the problem we have to overcome every day when we intubate. These are the natural curves of the airway, and this is the geometry we'll be talking about over and over here. And this is repetitious because that's the way we uh, learn things. So intubation is a system. This is an important model. Um, we have visualization components that can be DL or VL. And then we have tracheal access components, whatever we stick into the trachea. And we have the human operator. Okay, and we're gonna, we're gonna use this model of three components to an intubation system over and over in this talk. So dynamic stylets, these are stylets that have flexible shafts and controllable dynamic tips. And so currently that's fiber optic bronchoscopes and uh, the stylet that I built, the TCI dynamic stylet. Okay, and then we have static stylets. Those are malleable rods that we put into tubes, bougies and introducers, and uh, rigid rods that we use to work with video laryngoscopes. Now, the important thing is those, you cannot change the shape once you start using them. You can bend them, but once you bend, you're committed. Objectives, again, I want you to understand the intubation component coevolution, understand intubation system models, understand clinical geometry, understand DL geometry and VL geometry, they're very different, and understand dynamic versus static stylets, and then understand the evolution of combined technique itself. So intubation problems, these are the things we all intuitively know. It takes a long time to be able to intubate like everybody on this call can intubate. We train for um, you know, some, somewhere between four and eight years to be able to get to the uh, intubation skill level where we can safely intubate people who have no medical problems, have them have their knee surgery, and have them go the home, the home the same day and get to that one in 100,000, one in 50,000, no harm rate from the intubation, no major harm. Okay, it's expensive because training is, training is the most expensive thing we can do. Advanced airway equipment is expensive and complex. Fiber optic bronchoscope, somewhere between 280 and $300 a use. Difficult airway carts are about $300 every time we push them down the hall and crack them open. Most difficult intubations are not anticipated. And that's a really important point that we don't know before we intubate the patient if they're gonna be difficult or not. Difficult intubations are generally a two skilled provider job. And that uh, is very expensive to have two people in one room taking care of a patient. So. Intubation is a two-step procedure. We've got to be able to see the vocal cords. And then we've got to not only be able to see, we have to be able to deliver a tube through the vocal cords. So again, we're going to break it into two steps or two components, visualization components, 
tracheal access components. Intubation as a system, again, visualization components, tracheal access components, and operator component. Okay, now, the important thing to understand here is all of these components need to be in balance or the system does not work well. So if we have a video laryngoscope, which is the best way to visualize the trachea, and then we have standard tracheal access tools, but we have a medical student intubating as an operator, that's not gonna work very well. If we have one of us intubating, who's a very skilled operator, and we have DL and no intubation stylet, we're probably still gonna get the tube in. And so we compensate for equipment shortcomings via skills and training. And so tips and tricks and skills, skills, skills. And again, the most expensive component in the room is the operator and the most, the most expensive way to improve that component is through training. Training is outrageously expensive. So what we wanna do is have tools that lower the training that's needed. And then we can save a lot of money and create a lot of value as we move forward. So again, intubation geometry, this is what we have to overcome. There's a primary curve and a secondary curve. And importantly, they are in, the curves are in opposite directions and the inflection point is at the vocal cords. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the evolution of the co-components. And this is a story of visualization and access co-evolution. So we're gonna start at 1940 and we're gonna go through today. And the top timeline is visualization components. The bottom is access components. So 1940 is about when we started intubating people regularly. Um, and we use DL. First DLs were actually sometime around the turn of the century, but we didn't intubate people regularly. Um, and it really hasn't changed or evolved since then. They've changed a little bit in form and the lights have changed and things like that. But effectively it's a light on a stick and we move the tongue and jaw out of the way. So this is really the DL era or the DL evolutionary era. Access, malleable stylets, rigid introducers. Important thing to understand is they all share the same characteristic in that they're static. Once you've shaped them, you cannot reshape them while well in use. Okay, so the DL, how did we visualize in the DL era? We have to solve those corner problems. We flatten those curves. We create a straight line to the trachea and my eyeball, there's nothing in between my eyeball and the uh, book boards or I couldn't be able to see them. So everything is line of sight. The geometry that we use to describe the intubation model of this era involves a whole bunch of straight lines. Okay, so this is the alignment of axis model, straight lines. You guys have all seen this. Um, it never quite made sense to me and I had to think really, really hard, to figure out what everything was named. And it never quite made sense to me, but it was the model that we were given. And effectively we put a direct laryngoscope in and we create a straight line, everything straight, geometry is a straight line. Malleable and rigid stylets are fine because generally they're just going straight. We can shape them a little bit. Everything is static. So all tracheal access is static, okay? So why did we fail during the DL era and why do we feel, fail with DL now? Is it tracheal access or is it visualization? It's a failure of visualization. If you can't see the vocal cords, you can't even try for access. So almost all of our failures failed at the visualization point. And that's important because then that is the pressure that drove the next evolution of the visualization line. And that was the video laryngoscope. And so now we can indirectly view, we can look around that corner. And that really began the VL era of intubation. So once again, we'll go back to our curve and our geometry and our curves here. Now we're gonna look around those corners and that has real implications because we're no longer making a flat straight line we now have to work around corners or curves to, to achieve tracheal access. So we entered the look around the corner capability era with video laryngoscopy. And I don't know if you can see my mouse here, but this is the natural curves of the airway. And with a hyperangulated 
bladed blade, they are left intact. And so this is the pathway we have to follow with an endotracheal tube to access the trachea. So the geometry turns from a straight line to now a serpentine pathway, two curves, opposite directions, and um, inflection point is at the glottis. So now we need to update our, our model. And now we have the two curve theory that was introduced by a, a Dewey named Greenland and um, seems pretty obvious, but he did a lot of um, magnetic uh, MRI work and, and looked at the, the geometry and wrote a paper in the BGA A in um, 2010. And from what I can see, mostly this paper didn't have a lot of impact um, at the practical level. Unfortunately, it hasn't been well disseminated. Um, but what he says is there's two curves, they're in opposing direction, and there's an inflection point at the glottis. And that's the two curve theory. So we either need to flatten those curves with the DL, or we need to look around them with VL. So look around the corner, geometry is now serpentine. The problem is it's really hard to deliver tubes around corners. And we compensate for that via a lot of tips and tricks and a lot of force on, on the glottis and a lot of force on the anterior trachea. Um, that everybody's experienced this problem. I'm not gonna go through it, but um, intuitively you've experienced it. Uh, it's when you get to the glottis and you start corkscrewing that, that, um, that stylet or, or the, uh, the endotracheal tube, you know, pull the stylet back to relax the endotracheal tube, and then you start corkscrewing. Now that can't possibly be good for the glottis of the trachea. And we know at this point that it's not. So these are tracheal access problems. We are no longer having visualization problems. We're having tracheal access problems. And that's an important shift that a lot of people are at least explicitly unaware of. So we go back to our coevolutionary timeline, and here's the problem. We've evolved with visualization and access remains the same as it ever was, static access. This has created a tracheal access gap and that tracheal access gap is what is causing failure now. So intubation systems, we're gonna go back to that and we're gonna look at our current state, what's widely available. We have video laryngoscopes, absolutely superior visualization. The, the jury is in on that. Um, Everything says that if you have a video laryngoscope in your hand, it is exceedingly rare that you cannot see and you cannot visualize the glottis. Okay, tracheal access remains static and the operator is still highly skilled to get the job done, largely because they need to learn a lot of tips and tricks around tracheal access. First pass rates have not changed with video laryngoscopes and that is now science and everybody was scratching their head because we couldn't see before. So we figured if we saw better, then, then you know we should improve outcomes, but it turns out that hasn't um, been the case. So the tracheal access gap is our problem. And we have, a, we have static tracheal access in a serpentine world, and we have no ability to dynamically navigate. So no dynamic navigation widely available. If the curve doesn't fit, you have to remove the endotracheal tube or the device, rebend it and reattempt, and we're using brute force on tissue to turn corners. So it's bending and jamming, and that's what we're doing with video laryngoscopes um, some of the time to get the tube in. So what does that look like? Um, I'm going to go ahead and make you watch this for about 45 seconds. It actually goes on for about five minutes, as you can see, um, and you can see that this arretinoid is already dislocated, you'll see it pop back in here in just a second. Oop, wait a minute, wait for it. And there it is, it popped back out. Okay, so every single person on this call has been in this situation. There is absolutely no ability to control that tip or, or dynamically shape it. You are stuck, now it's pointing anteriorly you're going up to the end, to the trachea and watch this corkscrewing, wait for it. Okay, and there, now you're in. 
And that's a reinforced tube. That's not even a stiff tube. This goes on and on, but I'm not gonna make you watch any more of it. Um, so 80% of the time now in the VL era, when we fail to intubate somebody with the video laryngoscope, it's a failure of tracheal access and it's most often due to the lack of dynamic navigation. Video intubation, clinical problem, what's this look like on the street and how do people express this? I can see the cords, but I can't get there. So back to our evolution and co-evolution table here. Um, tracheal access gap, static access here has gone on too long. 2014, 2012 is about when people started using fiber optic bronchoscopes as dynamic stylets. And that began the dynamic access era. Okay, and so when we use those tools together, it's, we call this a combined technique, and we're gonna drop into combined technique a little bit here. Again, BL for visualization, fiber optic bronchoscope for dynamic access. And then what all the papers and all the studies show is that if you can see it with a video laryngoscope, if you're using a dynamic introducer, you can easily access the trachea. And we'll go through all the literature on that. So now let's look at our, um, at our uh, combined technique or our intubation model when we put a fiber optic scope in place for dynamic access. So visualization, video laryngoscope, fiber optic bronchoscope for as a dynamic introducer. And now we have two operator brains that need to, to be involved. And that makes, um, as you guys know, coordinating with anybody, especially under stress, takes mental task load and um, can get, be clunky and uh, be a problem in itself. So that's one of the limitations of this technique in its current state. Um, this is what the technique looks like. And I'm gonna zoom through this. This is uh, one of my patients in Rwanda. She had an amelioblastoma, um, a very crowded airway. And she was getting that tumor, she was getting a mandibulectomy. Um, most of the patients either could not have their mandibulectomy because they couldn't be intubated when the fiber optic bronchoscope was broken or they got a trach. And so we were able to put her to sleep. Video laryngoscope goes in. We go around the tumor and we can now see where we want to be. You can see everything's distorted and crowded. And then uh, again, a ambu scope or a fiber optic scope, not hooked to anything because again, we didn't have monitors in Rwanda either. Lots of donations, but not complete in, uh, sets. And then you can see once it arrives in the view of the video laryngoscope, it's now a dynamic stylet. And now you have maneuverability and everything looks very different. You can delicately maneuver it where you want. And then when you need to turn that second corner, you put the tip down and in you go. And then you can watch the two go through the vocal cords. So if there's any hangups, you can correct them immediately. So all of these things mean that it's a one, two, three. Uh, this is Chris, Dr. Christian. He saw this one and he performed the next one. And this is the way he intubates all of the amelioblastoma patients. So it's a one, two, three learning curve. <coughs> So VL, dynamic introducer, um, this is called a combined technique. We know, and we'll go through the lit literature on this, that there's higher first pass rates in rescue intubations as well as in anticipated planned intubations. It is less traumatic, which um, makes sense because we're no longer using brute force and we're no long longer using tissue to turn the endotracheal tube around those corners. And it's faster because it's easier. Combined technique VL plus fiber optic. So the promise is it's a superior intubation technique. And this is what the literature and all the studies show. Um, it's easy and intuitive for navigation and visualization. So both the tracheal or the uh, visualization component is now easier with the video laryngoscope. And now the tracheal access component becomes easy with a dynamic introducer. So it's got limitations though. It takes two providers, so you have to coordinate two, two brains in its current form. 
You're cross-purposing a fiber optic bronch as a dynamic stylet. Fiber optic bronchs are expensive and they're not immediately available. And remember, most of the time, we don't know we're gonna have a difficult intubation when they come up. So left-hand visualization, two hands to operate a fiber optic scope because um, that's the way they're designed and two operators. So these are the problems with the current state. Now let's talk about rescue intubations and it's, it's good to talk about rescue intubations because these are uh, arguably the hardest intubations we do. Um, attempts have already been made. So we're now on two, three, four attempts. Conditions are often worsening. It's high stress for the operator. We've now called for help. And if you haven't, you should have. And it means there's more brains in the room to coordinate. Often there's a crisis-like atmosphere at this point. Um, so it's uh, like Liza Minnelli said, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. It is easily the hardest conditions um, we intubate in. So let's go back to our visualization and access coevolution, and we'll run through this one more time. Static access era, VL, that improved visualization and made it easy to see. You can become an expert at seeing the glottis with VL in about five attempts. With direct laryngoscopy, it's someplace between 50 and 100 attempts. That's the VL era. So successful intubation rescue techniques after failed direct laryngoscopy in adults. So this was a paper published in 2016. Um, Mike Aziz is, a, is at the University of Oregon and that's my alma mater. So that's why I mentioned that. Um, and he looked at a, it's a retrospective study looking at a lot of rescues um, at, in its multi-center. And this really kicked off the VL era or solidified that a VL is a great rescue tool. So you can see over time here, this is 2004 all the way through 2012. Wow. And they looked at all of the different techniques that were used after a, um, after a failed attempt or after a, a failed attempt with VL. So you could use a video laryngoscope, a uh, superglottic airway or an LMA, flexible fiber optic scopes, optical stylets, and uh, lighted stylets. And you can see in these stack graphs that initially people grabbed the lighted stylet a lot here. And then fiber optic was, was uh, the next choice. And then you had video laryngoscopy. But as people had more video laryngoscopes available, and, um, and they were available at all of these institutions throughout this era. But you can see as people started to understand video laryngoscopy, what happens as the primary tool you grab when you're having difficulty with DL, boom, VL, okay? And so you can see VL has really by 2012 become the primary technique. And look what's happening with the fiber, flexible fiber optic scope. And the problem with the flexible fiber optic scope is if you're not using bronchoscopes a lot, then they become a much harder device to use, especially in a rescue situation. So success rates of each of these techniques. 92% of the time, if you grab the video laryngoscope, you could intubate the patient. So that sounds great, but that means 8% of the time you can't. That doesn't sound great. If we make that one in 10, that doesn't sound great at all. And then you look at a, what, what, look at the rest of these um, techniques in the rescue situation. These are not good numbers. I don't wanna 80% of the time be able to uh, rescue myself. I want to grab tools that work um, near 100% of the time. So why do we fail during the VL era? This is a study, a pooled study. Um, and they, they put C collars on patients to limit their mouth opening and to limit neck flexibility, and then use video laryngoscopes and ask, um, what is the first pass rate? So these are simulated difficult airways. And then how often do we fail? And what does the trauma look like in the patients? So 76% of, of the time it was a tracheal access problem, 24% of the time it was a visualization problem. So again, we see that switch when we start using video laryngoscopes 
from visualization as the primary problem to tracheal access is now the primary problem. And then the numbers, now I'm gonna take you through this really quick. Um, this is a scale where people, where they rate it as the view is excellent, good, fair, or poor. And so you can see that the view when they're using video layering or indirect video laryngoscopy, the view is almost always either excellent or good. And that's that superior visualization, okay? Um, ease of insertion, so this is tracheal access. Now you can see that um, with the D-blade, you know, you're starting to see more numbers pop up here where this is not easy, easy tracheal access. With the hyperangulated glide scope blade, you see them get bigger still. And then with the with a uh, McGrath, it's a little better. But uh, remember, a graph a McGrath is a standard geometry blade, and so the visualization is not as good. But tracheal access is a little bit easier. And then another important thing: soft tissue lesion and bleeding. And again, this is the bend and jam. So you get it in, but what's the cost? Nine out of uh, 120 patients were injured. 27 with the glide scope. Six with the uh, McGrath. Um, these should, we should be able to get these down to zero in the future. Okay, so now let's look at our current state just to remind ourselves where we are now. This is the current state rescue, VO for rescue, static tracheal access, one operator, static tracheal access in a serpentine world, 8% of the time we can't rescue the patient. So almost one in 10 of our rescues turn into mega attempts and we either wake the patient up or we, uh, we get the tube in, but we start to ta cause tissue harm. So no dynamic navigation widely available. If the curve doesn't fit, remove, rebend and reattempt. Brute force on tissue to turn corners, bend and jam. Um, I won't show you that video again. Uh, so again, back to our co-evolution table, static access, tracheal access gap, that's where we are on rescue intubations now. Um, we do have some, uh, some studies with uh, combined technique and anticipated airways um, and combined technique for rescue intubations. And we'll go into those now. So how do we address the tracheal access gap? Um, clearly it's dynamic stylets. This is what the literature says. We'll go through that. Combined techniques, VL plus fiber optic bronx is our current state, but really any dynamic stylet is a combined technique. And this is really the evidence that the tracheal, the dynamic tracheal access era has begun. Go back to our model just to beat the dead horse. Left hand visualization, left and right hand fiber optic bronchoscopes as a dynamic introducer and then operators, okay? So combined technique, VL for visualization, dynamic introducer. If you can see there with a VL, you can get there with dynamic introducers. So combined technique, and I'm gonna go through, now we're into the stages of evolution of combined technique because it has changed over time. The first randomized control trial combined, uh, comparing combined technique to a rigid stylet with video laryngoscopes in anticipated or known difficult airways <coughs> was performed by Rainer Leonard. He's in Louisville. And he's um, <coughs> a huge component of combined technique. So when this started, visualization was actually dual visualization. It was VL and then fiber optic bronch. And the fiber optic bronch was hooked to a screen so that you got uh, visualization from each. <coughs> so the fiber optic bronch was used for dynamic access, but also for visualization. So we're gonna call this stage the dual visualization stage of combined technique or stage one. Okay, visualization, two screens, dynamic introducer, fiber optic bronch, and then an operator. <laughs> so the, uh, the control group was, um, was rigid stylet or static stylet with a video laryngoscope intervention group. V 
video laryngoscope and fiber optic bronchoscope, both used for visualization. So the for, and these are anticipated difficult airways. Uh, first pass technique really, or first pass uh, success really wasn't much different, but the important thing was ultimate success was very different. And this was a crossover study. So if you could not intubate with one, then you crossed over to the other. Everybody that could not be intubated with a static stylet could be intubated when they crossed over to combined technique. And so that was the big, uh, big thing here was that you could always rescue yourself from a static stylet problem when you introduced a dynamic introducer. Okay, so then the next combined technique stage, stage two of evolution, was to take that second view from the fiber optic bronchoscope out. And so now you're just using the fiber optic bronchoscope as simply a blind dynamic stylet. And the only visualization you're using is with the video laryngoscope. And Mazzinari is in Italy. And so he did a, a randomized control trial comparing a rigid stylet versus a dynamic stylet with a video laryngoscope providing visualization. Okay, so important VL only visualization in this stage of combined technique. Fiber optic bronchoscope is simply used for dynamic access. So what this represents is a full separation of our components into access components and visualization components. Back to our model here. Visualization is now only in the left hand and it's only the video laryngoscope. Fiber optic bronchoscope is never turned on. It's simply used as a dynamic introducer. And then we have our operators, okay? So first attempt tracheal success and these are known difficult airways. 67% when you're using a non-dynamic or a static rigid uh, tracheal access tool. 91% when you introduce a dynamic introducer. And then look what happens to airway injury rates. 11% in the standard rigid static tool. 1% when you don't use tissue when you don't use tissue to turn corners and you don't have force on tissues when you have a dynamic stylet. Okay, and so what they concluded was first attempt intubation success was significantly higher when using the fiber optic bronchoscope as a dynamic guide during glide scope laryngoscopy compared to the standard stylet guided intubation. So, Combined technique, when we look at stage one and stage two, higher first pass rates, less traumatic for our patient, faster. And both of these techniques were rated as easier by the operators. Okay, so combined technique, again, the promise, it's a superior, it's a literature proven, superior intubation technique. The science is now in. Um, it is easy and intuitive to navigate and visualize, visualize. So both components, visualization and navigation components have been updated and evolved. Limits again, two providers, cross-purposing fiber optic bronchs as dynamic stylets. Fiber optic bronchs are expensive. They're not immediately available. And again, we don't know when we're gonna get into trouble until we're already in it most of the time. So limitations, visualization, operator. That's what we, the model we uh, use, but let's update our model to the real limitations. Left hand is visualization, that's great. Two hands with the fiber optic bronchoscope. But when you have three hands involved in the procedure, then you have two operators to, uh, to um, coordinate and that presents problems in itself. So the next stage of combined technique, stage three, dynamic introducers that are single-handed, they're purpose-built as a, as a dynamic introducer. 
they're no longer cross-purposing fiber optic bronchoscopes with all of their limitations. And, um, and they have dynamic tips, they have flexible shafts, and then our particular one has a removable handle and, um, and a depth gauge as well. Now, there is one other device on the market um, that is a dynamic stylet. Uh, however, it doesn't have a handle and it doesn't have full articulation. Um, combined technique stage three, so single-handed and purpose-built. So what do we have as evidence that um, to, to say what's happening when we introduce that? Um, Left-hand visualization, now right-hand dynamic access, and a single operator to control both components. So uh, we have a consecutive case series done at the University of Utah, and this is retrospective data. It was what we could get done during, um, during uh, COVID. And uh, Dr. Ashka Shah led the charge on this with, um, with others. Uh, we looked at all of our intubations for the last five years, retrospectively pulled those from EPIC, and then looked at different advanced airway techniques and different rescue situations to see what happened. <coughs> so this is a case series. Um, and we found 34 cases where a TCI had been used uh, as a rescue device. 97% um, overall success rate when it was used. 94% first pass rate. 3%, um, whoops. 3%, uh, one of them took two attempts. Um, so standard advanced techniques, we'll go back to that Aziz paper. The other advanced airway techniques are getting between 85 and 88% success rates. So it uh, looks superior. Now this is a case series. This is not a randomized controlled trial. So uh, we have more work to do to firm up the evidence. I'm not gonna show you this video because you guys are familiar what it looks like when you're struggling. Okay, so a sneak peek, another um, study. We have a case controlled study done, done from that same data. And um, we're looking at all the advanced airway techniques. So fiber optic bronchoscope, intubating LMAs and combined techniques um, from the last five years in anticipated difficult airways. And again, Dr. Shaw and Connect are leading the charge on this. Uh, the paper is written and it's submitted, but it is not yet peer reviewed. Um, anticipated difficult intubations. So these are primary either known or anticipated difficult intubations. We see a higher first pass rate when, when combined techniques are used as the primary approach. Faster in the operating room from in, wheels in the door to intubated, um, rated as easier to use and less traumatic to the patient. And this is the first data table. It's kind of busy here. We have VL plus TCI as a combined technique and then VL plus a fiber optic bronchoscope, fiber optic scope asleep and fiber optic scope awake. And again, these are anticipated difficult airways. And you can see VL with TCI uh, has a higher first pass rate than all the other techniques, even the other combined technique, a lower failure rate, and importantly, minutes from in the door to when you're intubated, 12 minutes for a TCI, a VL TCI when it's one operator, a little bit longer with combined technique with the fiber optic bronchoscope, but a lot longer when you get into the uh, into the uh, fiber optic scope um, used as used on their own. And that makes sense to people. Um, it's more set up time. It's harder to coordinate. Um, <coughs> rated as easy 83% of the time compared to the others and uh, atraumatic 96% of the time. Okay, so the speed in the room is important because all of us work under the pressure of, uh, you know, get the patient intubated because then the patient can, uh, can start, the, the surgery can start. And so these are some density curves of different techniques. Fiber optic asleep is in green, fiber optic awake is blue, and VL plus TCI is pink here. So you can see it's a really tight, 
curve, which means it's a really predictable time outcome. Um, this is the two combined techniques, fiber optic bronchoscope as a dynamic stylet and TCI as a dynamic stylet. And again, you can see that it is a tighter curve here. And so again, predictable outcomes. The surgeons don't much care in my um, experience if it takes 20 minutes or 15 minutes to do something. But what they don't like is when you think it's gonna take 15 minutes and it actually takes 30. And so that's, that's, uh, that's one of the values that, um, that combined technique can, can bring. Um, this also opens up the year of self-rescue. So when you start to struggle, if you have an immediately available device, then you can just grab it and solve your problems. And I know that, um, that some of you in this audience have, uh, have told me that that's, that's exactly how you use the device. Um, okay, so is this the end of intubation evolution, left-hand visualization, right-hand dynamic access with a dynamic introducer and a single operator? Um, that now needs less training to manage more difficult airways. Um, is that the end of evolution? No. So the next generation intubation systems, we're already working on those here at the University of Utah. Um, again, our system is tracheal access, visualization, and a human operator. And the next evolution is to add AI. So how does that change the mix? Now we have a smart video laryngoscope dynamic smart stylet, augmented human performance, and that should improve outcomes because we can now train people less. And remember, training is the single most expensive thing we can do to fix a problem. So we are working on Marvin here. Um, and some of you know about this, some of you don't. Marvin is our AI, our expert system. Marvin's about two years old now. And Marvin can, uh, Marvin's been eating video laryngoscope. This is why I've been having you guys press the red button and we collect all of our video laryngoscope intubations. We've been feeding Marvin for about two years. Marvin's already smarter than, um, than a resident is at six months with identifying anatomy and endotracheal tubes and uh, times and first pass rates and all of those things. Um, so that's our next step what we're, that we're working on. Um, Take home points for this talk. Intubation is a system of components. So I would encourage you guys, when you struggle with an intubation, when you're writing that note, if you could break it up into, I struggled with visualization or I struggled with tracheal access, all of us will be helped in the future when we read that note in the future, because then we'll know what equipment we need to have in the room. When we just say failed with VL, I don't know what, that's like when my wife says, be nicer to me. Um, if she can define nice, I can do it. If she can't define nice, it's really hard for me. So visualization, tracheal access, or was it an operator problem? Was it a medical student intubating? That's useful information for us. VL has changed intubation geometry. It's now a serpentine pathway. It's no longer, we shouldn't be thinking in straight lines, which we should be thinking in terms of a primary curve and a secondary curve that are in opposite directions. And that inflection point is at the, the glottis. And you'll notice the glottis, that inflection point is where we have tracheal access problems most of the time with VL. Dynamic stylets can overcome serpentine geometry. Combined techniques are best for most difficult intubations. If you can get a video laryngoscope in their mouth, then you can access the trachea with a dynamic stylet. Almost well, every, I will go as far as saying almost every time if the right team's in the room. Higher first pass rates when we use combined techniques. <coughs> Lower traumatic intubation rates faster in room times to intubation times. So little thought experiment here. Will we, will we be jamming bent metal rods into airways in 10 years? Um, my bias is I can't imagine that that's gonna be the case. I think dynamic introducers and purpose-built dynamic introducers are inevitable. Um, and it's simply a matter of getting them built getting 
everybody's intubation models up to date and getting them into wider spread use. And by doing that, we can lower the skill set needed to intubate patients safely, and that increases access to care everywhere. Now, most of you guys know that I worked in Rwanda and Guinea. Um, in Rwanda, the primary reason that people died or were injured during intubation was airway management. So we were at about a one in 400 to a one in 500 kill rate um, from airway management. And we had video laryngoscopes. Um, we didn't have them widely available. And so if we train anesthesiologists to get up to one in 100,000 kill rate from airway management, it'll take about 120 years to train enough anesthesiologists to meet the needs of the Rwandan population. If we can build better tools to get there, then we can use anesthesia technici technicians and we can meet the needs of that population in about 40 years, 30 to 40 years, because the training times are less. Right now, we fly helicopters out to Vernal to intubate patients because they, the, the skill set doesn't exist there in the EDs and the ICUs. Hospitalists are quitting every day because they have a traumatic intubation and they kill somebody. And they're it in some of the smaller hospitals because they don't have tools that are easy to use. So building tools that lower the skill sets needed to manage a wider variety of intubations in a wider variety of situations is how we create value and how we increase access to care everywhere. So I'm not gonna wait, make you watch any of this, but again, this video goes on for a good five minutes. This is a YouTube video. So um, it's public access, you can look it up if you care to torture yourself. Okay, um, I'm gonna stop sharing here and thank you all for listening silently. I'm much happier when we can all speak together and people can stop us along the way. Um, are there questions or comments? Sean, we have these, um, we have your articulating stylets that I, I've noticed at the main enhancement there on all of the glide scopes, but are they supposed to be on the glide scopes in the outpatient settings like Farmington and South Jordan? Um, so Carol, I stay completely out of that um, as a conflict of interest, um, but Todd would be the one to ask about that. My understanding is, is that, um, that they should be, but I don't advocate for anything here at the University of Utah. As you guys know, I don't even use the device here because of conflict of interest uh, issues. I just, when I'm working with any of you guys and we have a combined technique, I just grab one of our very expensive fiber optic bronchoscopes that somebody has to clean and we use that. Um, but I would ask Todd about that. Um, he, 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 would, he would be able to answer that question. Okay, thanks. I, I know they've been used out there um, because people have told me about rescues in our ambulatory surgery centers, um, but I, I don't really, uh, I don't have any idea how far forward they're placed or if they're, in, if they're available all the time. Okay. Uh, I would just like to add, uh, I had a patient that called it during intubation and basically the, your articulating stylus saved the day, saved the patient, so thanks. Well, thanks, Dennis. Yeah, and I, I got to say, it's a lonely job um, uh, developing a med device. So uh, I'm always happy to hear when the device works because it's a little bit of a little bit of positive reinforcement along the way. So um, thanks, Dennis. Yes, just curious, how much does the TCI cost? Maybe you said it, but I, I didn't hear it. Yeah. Um, so it. Uh, it's funny because at the University of Utah, they were one of the first adapters and we were selling at $150 a unit. And so that's what they bought it at. Um, we've since lowered the price. I think our average selling price is, um, is somewhere between 
80 and 95 dollars depending on who's buying it and then what volume um but the university of utah has been informed multiple times and uh they've never uh they've never lowered the price <laughs> and so i'm not banging at their door to do it but um so here it's it's uh i think probably 125 dollars a use kind of thing <clears throat> i'm not actually sure exactly what price they're paying um, but when you compare that to time lost in the OR waiting for a difficult airway cart, a bad outcome, or, um, or uh, having to use a fiber optic bronchoscope uh, that you, you actually save money using, uh, using uh, an immediately available dynamic stylet. And we have all the data for that too. You know, if you save five minutes in the OR, um, OR time at the University of Utah is $80 a minute. So you can do the math on that. Sean, thank you. That was a great presentation. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. And thanks Corey for, um, for uh, coordinating it and recording it. I always hit, I always forget to hit the record button. <laughs> Um, I, Sean, I will send out learner assessments to this group, and um, if Perfect. everyone wants to include some feedback um, for Dr. Reynolds to um, help him with his presentation, but thank you very much for coming today. We appreciate it. Yeah, and I'll catch some of you afterwards live because I, I do want feedback about what works and what doesn't with the models and the presentation um, uh, because it's, I think these are all really important models to start to spread because, um, you know, I didn't really understand much of this stuff before I started working on the device. And so I didn't design the device with any of these models in mind. It was all intuitive. And I think understanding these models can actually uh, really improve the way we take care of patients. So, all right, thank you. I appreciate it.